The Hogs Die is brought to you by TicketClub.com, your one-stop shop for live events nationwide. Whether you're looking for game, theater, or live performance tickets, don't sweat it. TicketClub.com has you covered. So make sure you're going there for all your live entertainment needs, and make sure you're clicking over to them from the banner at the top of thehogsdie.com. The Hogs Die presents It's Just Business with Steve Thomas and Rich Rogers. And now, here's your host, Chris Larry. Hello and welcome to another episode of It's Just Business on the Hogsty Network, the show where we look at the dollars and cents of the sports media industrial complex. I am joined by my compatriots, Steve and Rich. How are you doing today? Doing great, guys. Just waiting for some sun. <laughs> we have way too much sun down here in Texas. It was 96 degrees yesterday where I am with another hot one in, in store. <laughs> You know, I'm trying to get excited about the cap, the Washington Capitals. I really am. I'm just not enough of a hockey fan to get too riled up over it, but I know you guys are excited about it. Well, given that they are my number one favorite team in all of sports kingdom, I'm pretty excited. And you call I, yourself um, a Redskins fan. I, you can be a fan of two teams. I am excited because I'm a native Washingtonian and we have a local team playing for a championship and I actually like playoff hockey and I'm starting to understand it. So I'm excited Um, and I actually like the fact that normally this time of year, Redskins training camp and OTAs rule the day and all of these expectations and all these articles. But for once, the Redskins are actually flying under the radar for the Caps. So that might be a good thing. You know, I I don't understand hockey well enough to fully appreciate it. Like, I don't know what icing is, for example. You know, it makes no sense. It's like the puck goes one way and it's icing. You know, it's kind of like soccer, only more exciting. Like soccer, I find to me, I'd rather watch paint dry, you know, than than watch a soccer game. Hockey is definitely much more exciting, but I don't understand it any better. (laughs) I just think it. I like what I like about hockey, and and again, I am just, you know, I'm not watching, you know, Calgary and the Islanders in November, so I'm not a a, a big fan. But I will say I like the way that that the nature of the game they allow players. It's a rough sport. It, it's a rough sport. The you know the powers that be acknowledge that it's a rough sport. They don't try to over govern it. Um, they just kind of let it be what it what it is, and that's what I kind of like about it. I, it. It's gotten less violent, though, I think, in recent years, hasn't it? Haven't they tried to cut down on the fighting? <laughs> I got to say, I was on an airplane with several, maybe 15 years ago with the Philadelphia Flyers. I don't know what they were doing on a non-charter flight, uh, but they were on my airline flight into wherever I was. I don't even remember where I was coming from or where I was going, but... Um, let me just say that it was very obvious that a professional sports team was on that plane. You know, it was the loudest, most raucous flight I've ever been on. You know, God help anyone who's trying to sleep on the flight with those guys on that airplane. It's not like you could tell them to stop. You know, they'll beat you up because they're hockey players. Well, that might be a good transition into the fact that they were riding uh, in a commercial airline. Yes. Uh, that Not a chartered airline. And I actually ran in... In the early 90s, to the entire Washington Capitals, also on a commercial uh, flight or in the airport waiting for their flight. And in in my mind, it was very surprising. Yeah, and it might mine might have been in the night. I can't remember. I, don't hold me to 15 years. It might have been more than that. So let's discuss the NHL. Some interesting business style uh, stories, and especially since they're at the creme of their season during the Stanley Cup Finals. And not only just that, which would be a good reason to talk about it the NHL in general, we have a pretty remarkable story in that an expansion team, first year in the league, in Las Vegas, which is unique and interesting and has some real implications for other leagues as well, is in the Stanley Cup, is looking at how that happened, how they got here, and the state of the NHL's health in general. Now, those are a lot of topics, so we may only touch on some of them, but I think we probably will return to a couple of them as we go forward, especially as we start to look at the business models of the four major sports leagues in comparison on different elements. But we have Vegas and we have Washington, which has been one of the premier teams in the league in the Ovechkin era. And it's causing a lot of excitement in the NHL and a really interesting story and path for the Las Vegas Knights to the NHL. I'll say a couple things that we can jump into discussion. One, I think 
it's been an unqualified success for the NHL to have Las Vegas as a market, as a team, and I think has completely flipped the script on Vegas as a professional sports or just sports town in general in really less than 18 months. So that's interesting. Two, the NHL was able to extract over $500 million entry fee from Las Vegas, as opposed to when Columbus and Minnesota entered the league about 15 years ago-ish, I don't have that exact, where they paid $80 million each. So even if you added the entry fee for Columbus and Minnesota, it is not even in spitting distance of what Vegas paid. And because of NHL's revenue-sharing model, where the top 10 teams really bring pool their revenue and help carry the league forward, they Vegas was a very smart move for the NHL, but did they overpay? And by overpay, did they make sure to allow Vegas to be good fast and basically having the most advantageous entry roster stocking plan ever in professional sports? And it's very hard to argue with that considering that that team now plays in the Stanley Cup Finals. And I'll just tag on here and then we can slice and dice this topic that the ratings... Um, have actually been quite good. They've been setting records all postseason and in the Stanley Cup, both on NBC Sports' streaming services, on NBC Network proper, and on NBC Sportsnet cable. It was the most watched thing on all of cable on Wednesday night, which is a pretty big success for the NHL. Yeah, well, yeah, and first of all, I would say that in terms of the Vegas, are they the Golden Knights? The Vegas Knights. Not Golden, Golden Knights. Knights. Okay. In terms of them being good, I think that has to do more with their roster stocking than any sort of revenue, you know, sharing model. That's two different things, um, you know, because they could have done it differently. Um, but in terms of the re- NHL's revenue sharing plan, I find it interesting because it's truly the definition of communism. <laughs> you know, it really is almost exactly co- you know communism. But but I think the in- I'm just guessing here, but I'm going to assume that there's a wide disparity, unlike in the NFL between and, and probably Major League Baseball too. There's a probably a very wide disparity between the haves and the have-nots in the NHL, which is why they have this top ten, you know, revenue, you know, revenue sharing thing. Which, as you said, you know, the top ten teams kick in. See, the the, the NHL has a pool, a revenue sharing pool. The NHL as a league kicks in fifty percent, and the other fifty percent comes from the top ten teams, basically, and. I would assume that, you know, like the Islanders, the Kings, you know, the Boston um, Bruins, you know, teams like that, the, St- the, the the Detroit Red Wings, you know, the Chicago Blackhawks, those teams probably make a lot more money than like the Columbus, I don't even know what their name is, the Columbus Blue Jackets. Okay, the Columbus Blue Jackets. You know, as an example, I would assume uh, in a city like that, they probably make a whole lot less. And so this type of model is probably necessary to keep all those teams afloat, I would assume. Well, Columbus is a mid-tier market for them. Okay. In reality, what you have to think about is uh, two teams in Florida, a uh, team in Arizona, teams in places where obviously hockey's popular, but Nashville. Calgary, Winnipeg, oh, these yeah. are not, you know, there's not a lot of people there. So it's, you can even make an argument Columbus is a mid-tier. Well, well Nashville's been a rousing success in the NHL. That has been yeah. probably the most successful Southern market team. Yeah, but would you say, but what I, I would ask is, is Vegas really, because uh, Chris, you mentioned in your opening statement that Vegas, uh, they found that Vegas is a, a sports town. I don't know if we can really say that yet because I think we need to define what a sports town is because... I mean, everybody likes to rally around a winning team. So to me, I think the loyalty of the Golden Knights fan base would be judged if they have maybe consecutive losing seasons. And then does the NH- then then do do you determine whether it's a sports town and whether it was a smart move to have them go there? Because obviously, Las Vegas doesn't have a professional. Well, they uh, they will have a professional team, but they don't have one at this minute. Uh, they have an NFL team, but uh, right now. Um, everybody's riding the wave. So I, I like to wait and see before we, uh, as, as Dennis, the late Dennis Green said, before we crown. <laughs> well, I think um, there's two different ways to define what a sports town is. You know, the NHL would define a sports te- town as one that sells the most tickets. Whereas what I would define a sports town is as is one that there is a loyal fan base that gets behind the team and gets excited about it and loves the team no matter what. I'm not sure right. that's Vegas. Necessarily, right. that's what that's where I was headed. Yeah, yeah Vegas may sell yeah. a lot of tickets, but I don't know if they have a thriving local, you know, 
fan group of people that loves the hockey team necessarily. Well, I mean, any group of fan. I mean, any group of fans that go to a game with sequin gold jackets and <laughs> sit. Uh, I, 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 I don't know about that. I for their they're bad sports fans. Let's just say that, or they're early, young. That'll be right, that'll be generous. Right, right. But you know, I, I after game two when they had the sort of you know the continuing coverage, which yes, I was watching, and you know they were outside on this outside the stadium, and the Vegas fans were partying like they just won the Stanley Cup. They just lost game two, and you wouldn't have known it, right? So there is just an excitement level. They were lucky enough for them to be good. I, we can't know their long term sports fandom. But what I'm sort of more talking about was how a municipality rallied around and was able to ensure a business culture for them to thrive. And if you, I recalled our, when we talked about the NFL's expansion in Las Vegas, I don't know, probably eight, 10, 12 months ago, you know, we really were questioning, was there, was there the commitment? Was there enough people? And I think we probably echoed what the conventional wisdom was on that. Well, the NFL has got to be feeling a lot better after this, you know, let NHL take its lumps get its victories. The outlook for NFL coming to Vegas is much different now sitting here in, in summer of 2018 than a, even a year ago. And that's because of what's happened with the professional sports team via hockey. Yeah. Well, and, and by the way, you know, the $500 buy-in fee is NFL level. 500 million. Pardon me. It's not 500 billion. 500 million. It's not 500 billion. <laughs> No, million, no, but you said $500. Oh, I did? Yeah, okay. $500 million <laughs> uh, buy-in fee is more like an NFL-level buy-in fee, not hockey. You know, that is an enormous amount. I, I'm still worried about it. For, first of all, the, the fear of Vegas was twofold. It wasn't just can the team support, can the city support a team. There was also uh, they were afraid of corruption, you know, they being the sports leagues. That was the other half of it. You know, did the leagues want to be in the home of gambling and the home of – you know, mob controlled or formerly mob controlled, you know, casinos and all of that. I mean, that's a whole nother set of questions. And that most certainly is why the NFL was leery of it, probably more than the business model. I'm still worried about the business model, you know, because the NHL doesn't, you know, takes 20,000 people a night to be successful. You know, you know, the NFL has a minimum of 65. And I don't know how big the stadium's going to be. You know, I would argue that in a, in a hockey game is just another event you can attend in Vegas that they can sell tickets for. And people might come in and, you know, you, you know, choose to go to a hockey game over, you know, a late another show, for example. You know, but I don't know if that's really the case for an NFL game because it's expensive and all the rest of it. So I'm still worried. Is you my could point. Cut, I, I would agree. I'd sort of be – Fence sitting is the smartest move, although you can make the half glass full argument on that same thing where, you know, they're selling out pretty much every home game this year and, and or drawing pretty good gate all year. You know, yes, there's there's a game, but there's also 40, uh, 35 of them or whatever. I can't remember the exact breakdown. So there's also many more games. And if they were able to carry close to sell out, close to capacity over the whole season, which, you know, Rich's point, I love the NHL. I love hockey, but I also am not watching Calgary and Winnipeg in November either. Right. So like, um, you know, so to carry something across the sea, across an entire season with that many games, it, you could count it both ways. But what you also see is the hunger in the fans and the municipality for people to make this a sport welcome. And it's interesting because the NHL has had – it has to do stuff to stay relevant that the other leagues – don't want to do or want to see others win or fail at. And so they were the first one in Vegas. They came out of their lockout and basically gave NBC a no money, no revenue TV contract. They have to do those kind of, they have to have communism as their operating model. They have to experiment and be able to do things that the other leagues, you know, are in a more privileged position to not have to experiment with. Yeah. And in terms of the TV, you know, NHL is on, uh, the NBC Sports Network, you know, which is, is that the exact name of it? It's, you know, the, the NBC Sports yeah. Network. Okay. You know, and this is the one where, you know, in D.C. it's NBC Washington and, you know, there's, you know, NBC, you know, Houston, et cetera, et cetera. And yes. Well, there's a national, there's a national network too. I yeah, think. there is. But, you know, um, but it's all part of that group. And yeah, the NHL is making a lot of money on it. But what I would point out, I sent this a chart out a while ago on the Hogside Twitter account that listed the re revenue, the gross revenues of all the major sports leagues in the world, they include Euro Hawker, um, Euro Soccer, and all that. And 
the NBA, the NFL was way above and beyond everyone. They're at a little over 13 billion a year. Next, believe it or not, was Major League Baseball, which is at 9 billion. And then uh, the NBA was at 5 and surprisingly 5 billion and surprisingly the NHL was at 4. You know, so they're not really that far behind the NBA and you you would think that because of all the attention the NBA gets, they'd be way more abo- they'd be way above and beyond in revenue, particularly since they have a you know ginormous um, TV contract with TNT and ESPN, but it's hockey is really not that far behind. I was very surprised. And Euro soccer, incidentally, was below the NFL. You know, for anybody out there wondering. Yeah, you know, I think that the um, it, it was interesting is the NHL of the four major teams. The NHL actually has the largest league minimum uh, for its players, which I thought was really interesting. Um, the other thing, uh, the the fan base. For the NHL, I mean, is it? Would you say that in the NHL is a niche, is a niche niche, wherever you want to call, is a niche sport? I don't know. Um, if you look at, you know, hockey in the United States versus hockey in Canada, as you said, there are less people in Canada. But is is the NHL Canada sport, or would you say it's just as much part of the United States as it is in Canada? Who are you asking? Oh, it'd be impossible to say that. I think. I mean, it's. Canada's passion. It's Canada's baseball. I, right. I think you know hockey is a way more of a regional sport than baseball is, for example. You know, because people play baseball everywhere in the United States. Yeah, and Canada, hockey is Canada's sport. There's no doubt hockey is Canada's sport. It's not debatable. But in terms of the United States, I think hockey is very localized and regional compared to even baseball because, you know, like you mentioned, you know, there's a hockey team in Arizona now. There's, what, two of them in, in Florida. But how many Florida kids play hockey, really? You know, but how many play baseball? Well, a whole, a whole lot of them. How many people in, like, Georgia play baseball? Baseball's Georgia's big baseball state, you know, big youth baseball state. Is it a big hockey state? I don't know. I would assume probably not. But if you go up to Maine, well, yeah, obviously that's a big hockey state, for example. So I think it's a lot more regionalized and localized in the United States than – any of the other major sports. So to that extent, I would say, yeah, it's a niche sport. Or if you want to say it the frou frou shishi way, niche. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I will carry the mantle of the uh, team elitist. <laughs> um, so, yes, for sure. I think it's interesting going... Well, one, yes. I mean, it's very... It's weather-specific, right, in terms of it being an inexpensive sport to play. You know, if you're in Minnesota, it's not that expensive and everyone's got hand-me-down equipment. But if you're, you know, rink time, all that. So there's a big, big gaps there where, you know, a a basketball court or a baseball field, you know, is pretty universal in terms of lowering the cost and lowering the access. So that's going to that's going to keep it niche, uh, probably, especially in America. The thing that's interesting about why it's so close to the NBA, though, is because of its international appeal. NBA is probably the world. I mean, I think it's bigger than soccer in terms of its international appeal, especially if you look at trends um, and what youth like. But hockey has a very similar international draw. Its players are international. They play it, you know, in other parts of the world. So it it has a similar global appeal that basketball does. And I think it's the thing that links those. One of the things that links those two leagues. That's probably true. It's inarguable. You know, certainly it's more more of an international sport than football and baseball. You know, baseball, it's big in Japan. It's big in Latin America. Not so much in Europe. Not so much in Africa. You know, not so much in other parts of Asia. You know, hockey, big all throughout Europe. You know, Russia, Canada. So, yeah, I mean, I get it. Basketball is pretty much universal. I think you're right. Basketball is probably the most universal sport in the, in the world, I would think. Yeah, I would agree. So we will move on because we have a lot of topics. We might, we will revisit the NHL. I might say looking at some of the aftermath of the ratings would be interesting, especially in historical trends and as we look at its popularity. And I, I'd argue that, well, I'm not going to stay away from that. <laughs> we'll argue that whatever um, you were talking about, we'll do it on another show. <laughs> yes. Um, all right, so let's move on to our next topic, which I believe is, oh, yay, more... NFL, Ka- Kaepernick, uh, America's Jingle controversy. <laughs> America's Jingle? <laughs> well, I got I to gotta signal my thoughts somehow. Steve, <laughs> give us an update on where we are with the deposition, saying very legal beagle here. Uh, okay. Um, 
well, recall the issue here is that Colin Kaepernick filed a grievance against the NFL alleging collusion amongst the NFL and the teams to keep him unsigned. Eric Reed filed basically the same exact grievance um, just, what, a month ago or so. And so what has happened here is that um, Kaepernick's legal team have taken a bunch of depositions now to include Jerry Jones, Robert Kraft, Bob McNair, and others uh, for the, for the, the uh, you know, in furtherance of the grievance claim. And uh, by the way, the grievance claim is not in a court. It's in front of an arbitrator. And so the record, you know, open records and stuff are a little different. Deposition transcripts aren't public record anyway. Um, but because we have a media that tends to get a hold of these things, a lot of those transcripts have been leaked. The Wall Street Journal had Jerry Jones's deposition transcript. And what has come out of this, and, and Rich, I know you want to, you brought this topic to our attention, so I, th I think this is probably where, where you're going with it. What has come out of the deposition transcripts is that Jerry Jones, at least, and Bob Kraft, at least, both indicated that they had talked to President Trump um, personally about it and that Trump um, told them, meaning Jones and Kraft, that personally that it was not good for their, meaning the NFL's business, to let the anthem controversy go along. And so what um, Kaepernick's lawyer is alleging in essence here as a claim, as a case, is that President Trump... Um, the act by President Trump of trying to exert influence on the NFL is going to amount to co to collusion because he's going to argue that the owners freaked out because the president is uh, talking about this and so then they collectively decided to um, keep Kaepernick out. That's kind of the basic case. But Rich, I know you want to talk about it. So, so as part of those dep leaked depositions, um, the Miami Dolphins owner, Stephen Ross, actually acknowledged that he was on the side of the players um, until uh, Trump's comments. And he also admitted, along with the um, Texans owner, Bob McNair, that the protests were hurting their bottom line and hurting their teams financially. But what was interesting about Stephen Ross's comments is that um, it appears that um, there was some by him acknowledging that he was on he was he was on he had one position, but after speaking with President Trump, he took another. So there there at the very least there is a case to say that there has been some influence um, by uh, President Trump over this issue with owners. Um, that and also President Trump was quoted as saying that that this issue. Um, was very um, was very big for him uh, in terms of, of winning. So that could be a very uh, damning statement. And I can't remember, and, it, and I'm not saying that there could not be, but I can't remember um, uh, a president, a sitting president, um, having influence over professional sports. Um, but I think this is a very, this is something to watch. Because uh, with these depositions, I think at the very least, the owners have been influenced uh, by outside factors, which is probably not, well, it could or could not be a good look for the NFL because perhaps the owners are saying, well, we're just going on what the pulse of the people are. You remember, guys, we talked about that poll last, uh, the last show where uh, the a lot of, uh, I want the majority of Americans uh, felt that, um, the NFL had not done enough uh, for the protest, but I think this is a very interesting. Um, th this is this could be, this could be a, a smoking gun here. Um, well, yeah, first of all, factually, I don't know if Ross said he personally talked to the president. You know, no, he didn't say he talked to the president. Yeah, you he said, said you you said that the, the way you phrase it made it okay. sound like that. But Ross, I'm sorry. Didn't, Ross I didn't mean just heard, okay. yeah, Ross has heard that. Now let's remember. You know, the the thing is about this is. Also remember what collusion is, and collusion is defined by the collective bargaining agreement. And what it is is, in the case of the NFL, is an agreement between either the NFL as a league and one other team, or an agreement between two teams to do something. In this case, keep out Kaepernick and keep out Eric Reed in the other agreements case. And so, um, the idea that President Trump may have exerted influence over the NFL, which by the way is a dumb thing to do. You know, let's get that out there. Whether you're Republican or Democrat or independent or completely agnostic to politics, the president needs to think about something else other than the NFL for sure. You know, that's idiotic. But 
um, it's not enough for Kaepernick just to establish that the owners were influenced by Trump. What he has to establish is that there is an agreement. And so part two of this for for the Kaepernick side is to find evidence that the owners talked about this and decided, whoa, you know, we can't let the president bring down the league. So let's all agree to keep Kaepernick out. That's part two where they haven't really got to that yet. We've got to part one, which is President Trump has influenced them but we don't have anything about an agreement. So that's part, that's the next step. And that's the part that I think is way tougher for the Kaepernick side to get to because the owners are smart and they all have huge law firms to help them prepare, depos- you know, prepare for depositions and stuff. It's, I think, pretty unlikely they're going to get to that. But I could be wrong. Chris? The, inter- the interesting part for me... So let me just say a few things. One, I don't know enough about the legal back and forth to have... A, a very cogent answer. Do I think the owners uh, rallied around not having him in the league? Yes. Do I think they'll that they'll lose the case in court or arbitration? Excuse me. No. What I find interesting, and I'll, I'll zero right in on Jerry Jones's deposition comments, is actually what I've been thinking since early last fall, which was that this was a dying story. Kaepernick was already, however, was already out of the league. The players and the league were already in conversations about how to mollify this. And there was not a lot of momentum going into the league, into the season, excuse me, that these these were going to happen. The NFL had actually done a fairly good job, up to and including keeping Kaepernick out of the league, of being able to strangle the issue so that it was actually not probably going to carry into the well, season. I don't know if now. the NFL did that. The NFL just let it go long enough that it eventually lost the interest of the public more than anything. Whatever. Yeah. It wasn't going to be a story. I'm not giving the NFL it credit for strangling public... it, is my point, because they're idiots. My point is that Trump threw a bomb into it for his own personal political gains to play jingoism because it was the only thing he could get claps for. And Jerry Jones' statement says it outright, and it has ru- and, and, and it has been disastrous. And this is from a man, mind you, that has had a 30-plus year issue with the NFL – from the USFL days to the times that they wouldn't let him buy the Buffalo Bills. So I'm just going to say this straight up. Professional football, the NFL, is in deep jeopardy for dubious, stupid, not important, bully pulpit stuff from a president who had feuds to settle with the NFL before he was even in politics. Um, That's where we're here. That's why we're here. The NFL is in deep jeopardy. You know, if they lost the Kaepernick case, they're going to owe them some money, which they could find in their couch cushions. Okay. No, we're they're in deep jeopardy because of what we've been talking about for a year, declining. Yeah, ratings, well, that and that has dispute. a lot more to do. That has a lot to do with a lot of things. I wouldn't. I don't. It, it has a t- to do with the president crapping in the pool. There is Jerry Jones a, said in it part, straight up. It, he's not straight nearly up. the only reason for this, though. Um, uh, yeah, where we are right now, post kickoff of. I, I would argue season, right now. Yes, he is. That. Um, you know, the reason for the current resurgence of the controversy has nothing to do with Trump and has everything to do with the fact that the NFL decided to change their policy, you know, recently over the last month, which they, they were going to change their policy. It should have been last year, not this year, you know, it, cause like, you know, like you said, the controversy is kind of over in terms of, you know, p- the public consciousness of it, except for this Kaepernick lawsuit. Um, I think if they, at this point, if they had done nothing, it probably would have been fine. Um, but the idea of not only changing their policy, but changing their policy to one that was stupid and tried to mollify everybody, I think caused this controversy to, to uh, resurge and become and come back into the public light. You know, Trump hasn't, con- hasn't um, commented on the NFL in six months. You know, it was really the NFL's change in policy that has done it right now. You know, but in terms of Kaepernick, and so that those are that's not A equals B, Steve. That isn't. They were quaking. Well, I think in their they were over the it. next. I think they were over. My point no, is, the they, public if, is over. If they had done nothing, or if they'd had a more milk, you know, a more player friendly, whatever ruling that came out with, or just we would have been. It would have been kickoff weekend, 2018, and Trump would have been at some dumbass rally, and he would have thrown the NFL under the bus, and that was why they did. He hasn't what they talked did. about it though in a long time. 
You know, I, I don't want this to be. To. You know what? It, we need to. This is going down the wrong direction here. Well, I don't. It's my take. I, yeah, it's fine, uh, but I don't want to make this into a, the political hour. I mean, what we were supposed to then talk take about it up was with Jerry Jones. He said it. What we were talking Jerry about Jones was the Kaepernick it. lawsuit. In in the lawsuit, he said it. I, in the deposition. Well, I think Steve that that um, you can't you can't negate. The Trump factor because well, I'm he's not negating it. I'm just saying he, I don't want this to turn this into a blood feud between the three of us over politics. No, I know I don't it's think it's a, a blood feud. I think what we I think well I'll speak for myself. I think what I'm saying is that Trump has interjected himself. There's no doubt. You're right into an into an issue that he probably in a, in a couple of ways that he probably should not have. And I think the dangerous part of this is why is the leader of the free world having conversations with business owners about what they should and shouldn't do and what's more beneficial for him. So I think that's the dangerous piece. And that, and you know, to me, I, you know, and I get it from a legal standpoint, as a lawyer, it's not what, it's, it's what you can prove. Right. So, so there's, there's no, there's no proof of collusion, but they also believe that where there's smoke, there's fire. And, um, and, and I, and I think that when you, when you start, when, when you have owners already talking about presidential influence, and so it then look at it the other way. Are you meaning to tell me that Colin Kaepernick and Eric Reed have a fair shot of making an NFL roster on their abilities? Which, I mean, if you think that, then you're in some other kind of... Well, and first of, of all, I, I, I said in my initial comments that President Trump shouldn't have interjected himself into this because, you know, he should... It's not... It's nothing the president should be involved in i mean that's what i said so i'm agreeing with you guys on that um i my all my point was is that the trump influence that was in the depositions was that was last year you know the the cause for the resurgent controversy now is the new nfl policy that was my point um yeah but that's a reaction how do you not under how does listen i i'm not i don't care about politics right now i'm not you know yeah i hope we sign peace treaty with north korea all that i'm just talking <laughs> this specific issue you cannot logically argue that their fear of presidential reprisals drove their bad policy this these are all dominoes they're not disconnected i'm not, disag I'm not disagreeing is, with you i all my but you but you, i i wasn't even i'm not even disagreeing with your point on that I, all my point was certainly that's what jerry jones testified to in his deposition transcript and bob Kraft said something similar in his uh according to the wall street journal at least I was disagreeing with that. All my point was is that what they're talking about happened last year. You know, the 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 controversy now is because of the change in the national anthem policy. So yeah, there's an A plus B plus C equals D thing um, to it. But to answer Rich's question, um, and we've covered this before ad nauseum here, but you know, my point all along with Colin Kaepernick is that he did it to himself. You know, and, and what he's caused, what has Colin Kaepernick has put himself in a box in which the controversy that he brings and the tons of negative negativity he brings from half the fan base or a certain percentage of the fan base is his own doing. And so his play on the field isn't worth it. You know, if Aaron Rodgers did what he did, Aaron Rodgers would be on a team. Aaron Rodgers could shoot somebody in the middle of Constitution Avenue and he'd be on a team, whereas Colin Kaepernick isn't isn't good enough for that, and that's fundamentally why he's not on. Big Ben Roethlisberger, one could argue, sexually assaulted somebody, and did the Steelers care? No, not one single bit, and they did everything they could to protect him over it, um, because he's an all pro, and that's just not what Colin Kaepernick is. And so it's a cost versus benefit thing. The cost of Kaepernick is a ton of negative attention, and the benefit is that he is a backup quarterback. So you know, Steve, I yeah. think you I think your I think the the emotion and as you stated on this show and offline, your your ties to this story and your um I hate the how protest. close this is to you is is just completely causing you not to be objective in this particular story. I, we already know how you feel about kneeling and the disrespect of the flag. It wasn't to what say, I was talking about to here, say, but go to ahead. Say, no, 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 no. To say, that, to say that, you know, this is Colin Kaepernick's own doing, and this is where the danger is in that statement. What is it's because you haven't allowed... No, no, no. You haven't allowed the process to play out. You've already decided that whatever the outcome is, is his fault. And you, you're not even taking into consideration the owner's part in this. You're already saying 
that because of what Colin Kaepernick did, no matter the outcome, it's his own fault. The outcome without of what? any, without, the outcome wait of a what? minute, wait, without, wait a minute, without any potential culpability of the owners and your refusal to believe that there's a possibility that they've actually colluded. You've already determined that it's his fault that he's not in the league. And I he's not good determined enough. that they hadn't colluded. I and he's, he's not, not better, and that he's not better than, um, what's one of these other, uh, that he's not better than some fourth string Richard Hogan, uh, and you know, it, it, he is better than some of these third string quarterbacks. I never said okay. that. Of course he is. You know, he's a much more accomplished quarterback than you know, Richard Hogan. He's the Redskins third string quarterback for us. I never said that. Um and I never said what I've said about the collusion is that I don't think he's gonna be able to prove it. I don't think I don't think he's gonna be able to prove collusion. You know, the owners are too smart for that. And I think the the most reasonable answer I think the most probable answer is the most obvious one, which is these owners look at it and go, gosh, what's he going to bring to the table? He's not going to be a starter. He's going to be my backup, and he, we're going to get bombarded with um, with negative energy from the fan base. And so why should I bring in a guy like that? I, the, to me, that seems far more likely than a, you know, a bunch of owners in a smoke-filled room colluding to go, ha-ha, let's keep Colin Kaepernick out. I, I just think that's – I think it's Oliver Stone conspiracy theory type thing. That's all. I, I would be – well, first of all, I think – the better uh, comp would be the, not it would be Cam Newton, not Aaron Rodgers. So I'd be curious to see if if Cam Newton was doing. Well, he's what an NFL. Kaepernick, he's an NFL MVP. So I would say he'd be on a roster too, no matter what. Well, I, I say I'm. I, we don't know a, and right. I'd say the we more interesting that. comp would be Cam Newton than Aaron Rodgers. Well, Aaron Rodgers is white and Cam Newton is black. Yeah, I, yeah, I think Cam Newton's a much better quarterback than Colin Kaepernick because objectively his resume is way better. So I think Cam Newton can probably shoot somebody dead too and, and be on a roster. But yeah, if that ever happens, then we'll see. You know. Yeah, I'm just saying that whatever. And, and the other thing about Cam is that the oh, Jerry Richardson, who used to own the, um, the Panthers, was about the most conservative owner in the league. You know, and so if he had done something like that, I think the reaction in Carolina would have been whatever would have been extreme, probably because of Jerry Richardson. Now, the guy who just bought the Panthers is completely opposite politically. You know, he hates Trump, President Trump. He spoke out many, many times against President Trump. I doubt he's a conservative politically. And so I would think that would probably lend itself more towards a hypothetical support of Cam Newton in the event Cam Newton hypothetically does something along those lines. Uh, here's why I'm upset about this. There's many reasons I'm upset about this, but the, here, here's what probably pushes me into emotional, not intellectual. At, we are being so emotionally manipulated at all times on all fronts. And so this situation with the NFL is probably one of the most stark versions of this. And it is rip and it is another example of a fabric of the country being ripped apart because the NFL was a common denominator. It was a water cooler thing. It was something where I don't give a crap about your politics if you're, you know, want to watch the game together or we root for the same team or we want to debate quarterback versus quarterback. And so the reason and, and and the reason why I can't divorce the media manipulation for curating type of move is because that's actually the milieu. I'll, I'll keep my stereotype <laughs> attacked. You're, you're elitist. That's, <laughs> yes, I'll drop zeitgeist sometime just to solidify it. But that's that's what is so frustrating that and and that the intensity of the culture war plays out in something that was a common denominator. And I do think without the firebomb in the middle of it, some, it would not have ratcheted up to this level. Oh. I mean, I, I, I don't, it's gotten to the point where I don't even want to, I'm like just over the NFL, not because I don't love it or I don't love football or I don't have decades of connection, but it's just, it's another thing I just want to look away from. Yeah. I mean, look, I hate what Colin Kaepernick did. If I was an owner, I'd never sign him at anything. Um, but Logically, I don't think he's going to be able to prove collusion. You know, Rich, you want the last... We need to move on. Rich, you want the last word on this? Um, the, the bottom line is, if you were an NFL owner and you say you don't want to sign um, Colin Kaepernick, um, you we are forgetting 
that this is a good old boys network. They talk just like in any other job. Owners talk, and I do not give owners credit, most owners credit, for being able to strictly keep it a football decision and say that this person, while may not be a, you know, a top starter, can help my football team win. And I think that, um, I, I, again, Steve, I know about the law and all of that, but the eye test tells me that this is collusion through and through that has been, and the president has essentially bullied the NFL owners into enacting a policy and keeping not only Colin Kaepernick out of the league, but also Eric Reed. All right, fair enough. The, Last word. The smartest thing sorry, the smartest thing the NFL could do is someone sign Eric Reed. <laughs> I just wanted to be completely strategic about it. There you go. Anyway, next on, let's move on to the NFL fan experience. Because we can't give it up, people. That is a funny segue. So, Rich, I'm going to hand the talking stick over to you, and you can bring us into this conversation. So uh, I just gave my deposition last week on the NFL's collusion on parking at the at FedEx Field that has not allowed me to park in a reasonably uh, convenient location. No. <laughs> so, uh, no. So, the uh, you know, the NFL is taking a big hit. And um, the, the Washington Redskins have, um, and, and Dan Snyder is uh, hopefully taking a uh, turn for the better in his philosophy. Uh, he's recently hired uh, Brian LaFamina, who essentially has worked at the uh, NFL league office. Um, and... Um, when you look at his bio and where he's been, that was one of the areas where he specialized in. And then I know that the the um, Steve, you and the Hawks, I have talked about him and yeah. and what this means for the Redskins. But I thought this was very interesting that Dan Snyder would um, would move in this direction. And I think it's a good thing. As a fan who attend, I don't have season tickets, but I attend between four and six games a year. And I remember going to FedEx Field. Um, when it was first built and I know and I go now um, they have made some cosmetic changes um, but essentially um, what I'm hearing and seeing and reading in the article that I read with Fox News is that the NFL ranks near the bottom of all of the sports teams, and not only the four major sports teams but also um, looking at uh, soccer and other things in terms of fan experience um, one I think that um, many NFL teams have tried to take a uh, proactive steps at lowering uh, concessions costs and, um, you know, in terms of um, amenities. I mean, I know you can look at TV at Jacksonville Jaguar games and people are like sitting in the pool watching games. <laughs> and uh, I've gone to Redskins game and they have standing room only tickets um, and things like that. And they had an incident a couple of years ago with those standing room only tickets that I won't get into which truly could say the fan experience has been. Wait a minute, you're going to drop a bomb like that well, and not get into uh, it? Maybe <laughs> two on, rows man. over from us they in the standing room only seats. Um, uh, a man and his female friend. This. Yeah. Okay. yeah uh, so Engaging in activities they, that are not appropriate were, for public. There view. you go. So <laughs> maybe one could look at that as an improvement of the fan experience. But uh, in all seriousness, um, I think that um, the NFL and, and our beloved Redskins need to do more to improve the fan experience. I actually think that um, amenities, you can no longer have stadiums that are antiquated. And I think that our Redskins are moving closer towards that. Um, parking has always been an issue. Um, again, with FedEx Field, it's not accessible by public transportation. Um, one of the, I think one of the biggest successes of the Citibank facility where the Caps and the Wizards play is that it's in a downtown epicenter and it's metro accessible. So there are a number of different things, guys. Um, the NFL, I think, with all of what we've already talked about, they have a they have an issue with uh, the NFL fan experience. What's your take? Um, okay. Well, first of all, isn't there, there there's a, a metro stop across the street at the old Cap Center site, right? In terms of metro? No. Across the freeway? There isn't? The closest okay. one is... Not no, the closest one is Addison Road, which okay, is a bus. Well, you have to take a shuttle. Okay, well, regardless, um, and and I was at game number two at FedEx Field in what nineteen ninety six, I believe it was, 
Um, you know, and I wasn't particularly impressed with the stadium then, number one. Um, so I don't think it was ever really nice. And I know it hasn't gotten better in the last 20 years <laughs> over it. But um, I think the NFL needs to ca- cares less about fan experience than other leagues because they don't have to care. You know, all these games sell out. It, you know, there's only one or two games every one or two years that don't sell out. You know, and that's really all that matters to them. And so um, I don't think the NFL has really had to pay too much attention to it. Uh, in recent years, and particularly the Redskins, because Redskins have sold out every game since, what, 66? At least by NFL, the way they NFL counts games, at least. Um, you know, and so, you know, they're, they're not replacing stadiums to improve fan experience. They're replacing stadiums to incre- increase profit margin, you know. Um, but I think this kind of flows into the general downturn of interest in football, at least ratings-wise, is... Um, you know, I think you're right, Rich, in that in today's world, because the interest is downturned a little bit, they probably ought to start paying more attention to it uh, than they have in years past. But certainly it's more motivated by profit than it is they really care if Rich has to park five miles away and walk. They couldn't care less about that. The, the fact that football, and sorry, NFL, finds itself at the bottom of the list is probably a success metric for the NFL. Yeah. Um, now, that doesn't, I don't, I would, I agree house is smoking going forward, you know, I, so I don't want to, I'm not here to argue against making improvements, thinking about that, but it really is means because they don't have to care. That's why they show up last on these lists. So that means that's like being the king, right? So I think that's a, an evidence of that. And also the reality is that every other, I don't, well, I don't know. I'm not going to comment on international soccer, but for the other major sports, you know, they just have that many more home games. They have to think about the fan experience. You just have more seats to fill over more days over larger chunks of the calendar. So it it just necessitates that you have to think a little bit more deeply around that. I'd argue that the NBA, the NHL, and Major League Baseball have done such a good job with the fan experience that it's actually helping to show a stark divide. And as dollars shrink for entertainment value— you know, people are starting to opt into going to games with their families or with their friends to those other leagues because of those things. And the NFL is going to have to learn to catch up on some of those fronts. But, you know, does the NFL care about this right now? I'm not sure it's super high on their list. They'll only care if they don't sell tickets. <laughs> you know, that's the bottom line. I mean, it, you know, like I said on the show before, there's a reason the NFL doesn't do bobblehead nights. You know, we, we don't have Eli Manning bobblehead night because the NFL doesn't need to sell bobbleheads or give away bobble buy bobbleheads to give them away to, to buy to sell tickets. I said that very poorly, and you got what I was trying to say. Whereas, you know, in in uh, Major League Baseball, well, you may need uh, Bryce Harper bobblehead night to you know to on a Tuesday you know, in the middle of June to sell some tickets, you know, and so the NBA, the NHL and Major League Baseball have to care about the fan experience more because they want to make it easier for families. They want to make it easier for people to attend games and want to attend games. So if you put up with the nonsense the NFL makes you put up with in terms of costs and parking and blah, 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 um, they wouldn't sell as many tickets, whereas the NFL is going to sell those tickets no matter what. And so they don't have to care, as uh, Chris said. Well, You know, well, then I think that that sort of makes the case for why a lot of fans um, are not uh, very have a positive view of Dan Snyder is not only because he hasn't won is there's a perception that he doesn't care about fans and has done little to appease fans. Um, I I do think I I think we make it I, I think it's too black and white to say, well, the bottom line is money. I think many owners do want to improve their um their fans experience and make money but i think to me with more so than the nfl than anywhere else it's about winning i mean i i think we'd be amazed as antiquated as fedex field is i think that a couple of 11 and 5 12 and 4 seasons (laughs) might help (laughs) i would tell you I, I think it would help. I mean, because people want to, people want winners. Nobody, nobody would when the R, the whole RG three crusade. Nobody was talking about the what the, the the field or the the game. I mean, the the stadium is about winning. Again, a couple of uh, again, a couple of twelve win seasons, eleven win seasons, and you know, I don't think we're talking about the uh, the fan experience. 
Yeah, I, I mean, the, the the argument in favor of what you're saying is that, you know, the, the owner of the Atlanta Falcons has arranged to have the concessions prices at in Atlanta be lowered for the upcoming season. Now, I don't know the ownership structure of the stadium out there. I think it's it's owned by – most of these stadiums are owned by a – a uh, quasi public entity controlled by the county, and I think that's what Atlanta has. But the bottom line is the Falcons have Robert. Uh, is his name Robert Blank? Michael Blank? Mr. Blank? Arthur. 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 Thank you. Arthur, Arthur yes. Blank has personally arranged to lower concession prices, and that is a direct bid to improve the fan experience. And so there's one out of 32 at least that started down that road so the ravens just this week announced price reductions on concessions well there's two so we're at two of 32 but here's what i here in terms of the fan experience but here's a here's a thing that i think the risk has really tried to do but i see other teams do it better is the before and the after is this is the thing like so what do fans do two hours prior to the game are they Damn actually it spending money in the stadium or are they bringing their stuff and getting like inebriated on the parking lot so improving the experience before the game and after the game nobody hangs out inside of fedex field after a game even a win now maybe Um, before but not after now one thing the redskins of course are doing to a fan and prove the fan experiences are pimping out their cheerleaders (laughs) that's one thing they're doing that's one thing that you know i I think mr you know dennis green personally was you know was bringing you know cheerleaders out to entertain uh you know rich fans and so there's one thing that many other teams aren't doing well we there we think that they don't (laughs) well possibly yeah we think (laughs) yeah well i mean i think (laughs) If I uh, that that was a good zinger, Steve. I got to give you credit for that one. Your, I your, come up with them every once in a while. Your your comedic timing uh, served you well this. Time. <laughs> but no, I, I you know I again I, I think for me, um, I, one thing I don't like, and this is I, I you know I do engage in in alcoholic beverage now and then, but I think the NFL and this is something that they um, that they have to get at the the, the amount of uh, alcohol consumption. Uh, at NFL games is just it be before games is just ridiculous. It's probably a mountain of beer cans the size it's, of that. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So uh, the no- inevitably, when I talk to any fan that regularly goes to games or stopped going to games recently, doesn't matter the market, doesn't matter the team, doesn't matter their age, they say that the public inebriation at games is having a significant negative effect on the enjoyment of the experience. I wouldn't want to bring a young kid to that. No way. No way. And I've had this from people that don't have kids. Yeah. You know, so it's, I mean, yes, but it's not, it's really. It people really don't want to be problem. around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That death and destruction like that. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't probably want to be around it. I wouldn't tailgate for that reason. You know, and I, I don't go to a lot of games, but when I do, I just go directly into the stadium. I'd rather watch warm ups and everything else than go hang out with a bunch of drunks in a parking lot. But that's me. But that's a good point. And before we move on, because I know we have to move on, because, you know, Steve, you say the NFL is about money. So yeah. then why is it advantageous for the NFL to open its gates three hours before kickoff? Where is their money? Where is that? Where is that? Concessions. The concession stands are open. No, no, no. Right. I'm talking about. No, no, no. I'm saying. I'm parking saying lot. parking lot. What's advantage? Um, I mean, you know, it's a bid to fan experience. I think mm-hmm. that's one thing they do. But mm-hmm. remember, I mean. You know they're making money on parking. <laughs> you know right. it's not like it's costing them money. It's costing them nothing to open the parking lots early. Okay, I mean it. it they're making money. They're going to sell out the parking no matter what. But it costs them. Only thing it costs them is the hourly rate. You know of the guys who are manning the parking lots, and those people are county employees or stadium authority employees, not team employees. So it doesn't cost the team anything. And they have didn't FedEx. Haven't they started to tier access for and you pay more for premium tailgating yes. locales? Yes. So they also yeah. So they've also made you know. So, so they're tapping uh, into it like that then. Yeah, right. and it's also a cultural thing. It, I mean, I I actually happen to enjoy tailgating while I acknowledge that it's probably causing some of those things I just talked about. Yeah. Um, but it's also cultural. I'm guessing football. you're not pounding twenty beers at a tailgate either, though, Chris. <laughs> No, no, I'd I'd be bragging about three, yeah. but um, <laughs> but yes, um, 
But it's 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 it it would be very culturally difficult to separate tailgating from the professional football or collegiate football experience actually. Yeah. 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 Great point. Yeah. Okay. But it's definitely driving the drunk and disorderly. There's no doubt that's a A plus B. Yeah. Tom. All right, we have one more topic here um, at this meaty show, and that is uh, we're updating. This is I like this. We're kind of constantly updating stories because there is always news. So have I'll we talked about brief... this before? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so is what I remember. Just about Peyton Manning and some other professional sports figures, including Ryan Zimmerman, um, getting caught up in this Al Jazeera, U, uh, the U.S. version of Al Jazeera, which is now defunct, um, report linking these players to uh, performance-enhancing drugs. So, Steve, do you want to give us what the news item is? Yeah, and as an aside, whoever thought that Al Jazeera America was ever going to work wasn't thinking clearly. But, um, okay. Al Jazeera America put out a documentary called The Dark Side, The Secrets of the Sports Dopers, in which they alleged Ryan Zimmerman and Ryan Howard, among others, were doping. And um, Zimmerman and Howard sued Al Jazeera America for libel, uh, defamation, uh, for this law, for uh, because of that documentary. And interestingly enough, what came out of this is, and Manning's name was mentioned, and what has come out of this and what's the update recently here is that um, the, the document, the documentary was based in part on a, the testimony or the, the uh, input of a guy named Charlie Sly who alleged to be um, who alleged to be working for a, uh, he was a pharmacist who worked at a place called the Geyer Institute in Indianapolis and what Sly said is that Manning and his wife both were at this place the Geyer Institute uh, constantly all the time and then that the, the Geyer Institute a doctor there was shipping Manning under the name of his wife HGH meaning human growth hormone all over the place um, and so that's what Manning got mad about and threatened to file his own lawsuit, which he didn't do. The NFL then came in and investigated it for what seemed like five minutes and decided that there was nothing credible to it. What has come out here is that this guy, Charlie Sly, has recanted his testimony. Um, but um, he's recanted his inputs and said, no, 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 you know, I was lying about all this. Al Jazeera is arguing that his, at the, his actual recanting of his... Um, inputs was false and was influenced by lawyers from the NFL and Peyton Manning and they claim meaning Al Jazeera claims that one of their sources was Manning himself to this which is just amazing to me and um, so this is a case here of Manning uh, you know certainly Howard and Zimmerman are protecting their legacy but Manning is by far the biggest name out of here and um, if you want to play Oliver Stone you could argue that you know Manning retired at exactly the right time, um, and so he can he's you know was protecting his football legacy. But this is a stay tuned. We'll see more uh, here of this because the most interesting point of this part of this is that Al Jazeera claims that Manning himself was one of their sources for this documentary, which just blows my mind. So there you go. And I think there's a now that Manning's lawyer is saying you know he's got a conflicting statement now. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, and, and and um Al Jazeera sent this to libel counsel before they broadcast this thing, which is a smart thing to do, and they have a big hoity-toity law firm doing this. And so then Howard and Zimmerman are alleging that the law firm itself was one of the um corroborating sources for this documentary and of course the law firm says no that we, we would never do that so there's a lot to this story the biggest thing here the biggest input into it i think is if somebody can prove that manning not only did hgh but was somehow just al jazeera source you know he will simult he will have instantaneously ruined his football legacy so mm. stay tuned Stay tuned, kids. Uh, you think so? You think he'll be? You think he will have ruined his legacy? I, I, in my opinion, you know. Last if, I checked, A Rod was a talking head on the Major League B Baseball Network. A Rod has also been disgraced in terms of his baseball. You know, is A Rod going to make the Hall of Fame? Anybody think that? Uh, it'll uh, be Barry no. Bonds isn't in the no. Hall of Fame. Al, I'd say pretty, no, but it'll be interesting. But his pup, but he hasn't. He's not in hiding. Do you think Peyton Manning will make the Hall of Fame if it's proven in a lawsuit that he was a doper? Uh, they might keep him out for they might keep him out for a few votes, 
but nah, I don't think I think he'll get in eventually. Okay, we'll see. I, I, I just I just think that the NFL's scruples and more I just don't know and, you know again unless you in, in in my opinion unless you go to jail or unless you do something soup like you know major felony or something like I, I don't think anybody's going to really care I think but for the purpose of this discussion um that would label him you know a cheater but I don't know if that if that would be enough to tarnish his entire career I mean he played for a long time he set a ton of NFL records. I think people may be able to compartmentalize the fact that he essentially um, had fused bones in his neck. So maybe he did something to be able to play a little bit longer. But I don't know if anybody's going to look at his entire career and label him a cheater for his entire career. We'll see. Stay tuned. It'll be interesting. Yeah, yeah. it'll be interesting. The NFL's got a longer history with, with performance-enhancing drugs, so I think people slough it off a little bit. I mean, it goes back to the 70s. I think most people assume NFL players are somehow, you know, enhanced. Yeah. I think that it's a different than baseball, just in public perception, whether that's right or not, is not what I'm here to discuss. It's just the fact. Well, and the, and the major players in football have not been busted, whereas you had the home run, the all-time home run king has been labeled a steroid user. You know, Mark McGuire, you know, Sammy Sosa, you know, big, you know, Roger Palmero, Clemens, Palmero. Palmero, all bunch of Hall of Famers. And, you know, that hasn't happened in the NFL yet, except for Manny, you know, and we'll see about him. You know, when players are playing into their late 30s and early 40s, uh, you know, this is just isn't biology, right? Like, I think, like, we, we have this sort of, like, p- constant public amnesia because we like the exploits, we like the story, and we like their, their output. But, like, yeah, there is something medically enhanced about professional – a 40-year-old can't Athletes. pass a football like a 20-year-old. Right. You know, like, yes. Like, we should just we should be assum- assuming. Now, whether what's legal, not legal, sanctioned by the sport or not is something that we'll continue to figure out. But this idea that players can suddenly still play into their 40s is, you know, yes, something's going on. Yeah. And you could argue part of it is to improve training techniques and, and attention to nutrition and everything else. But, yeah, what it is, you know, who knows? Could you know? Yeah. Would I would I put it past Peyton Manning to do some steroids to help his back and his neck and play longer? No, I wouldn't. I just think it's real interesting about this story is that Al Jazeera says Manning is one of their sources. That just blew my mind. I wonder if it's why he didn't take, you know, the color commentator jobs that he had to pick. Well, yeah, you, that's you have to wonder. Thing. You know, sure. like it it is interesting because that's an easy gig. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, they 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 travel Friday through Sunday. You know, and then they're done. You know, and there was and a bidding war. He would have made fifteen million dollars for yeah this season. Yeah, no stress. Yeah, I, it make it. I, that thought went through my head too. But we'll just have to wait to see what comes out of this lawsuit. We will see. All right. So I think we that was an action packed episode. So I think that draws us to a close. It's a bit of a probably bloated on the time front. So we will bid you adieu. See, look at me. I'm just going to play into stereotypes the whole time. A little French. <laughs> um. So I am Chris, Chris Larry33 on Twitter. Rich. I'm Disco Q D I S C O Q U E five at Twitter. Um, I am at the Hogsty. At the Hogsty. I All do right, not have so a personal Twitter. We will see you in two weeks' time, and we are confident we will have stuff to talk about. See you then. All right, guys. <laughs>